All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the result that I'd like to talk about today is a rank rigidity result. And this is one of kind of a circle of results um, which, in which we are able to characterize locally symmetric spaces by a particular uh, type of property. And this type of property is having a higher geometric rank of some sort. So let me start by saying what I mean by this higher geometric rank. So the setup is the following. Uh, suppose that suppose that along every geodesic uh, gamma sub v in a manifold. So we're looking at geodesic here with with initial uh, direction v. Um, suppose that there exists a parallel vector field P sub V such that the sectional curvature between the geodesic direction and this vector field is a constant C, and this will be the same constant uh, for all geodesics in your manifold. Um, uh, so we say that M has higher, well, first I'll talk about Euclidean rank. This is in the case where C is equal to zero. Uh, this is what you're used to uh, hearing about for a uh, higher rank for a manifold. But we can also extend this to negative and positive curvature. So if C is negative one, we say the manifold has higher hyperbolic rank. And this is the situation that I'll be talking about today. And if C is positive one, we say that the manifold has higher spherical rank. Okay. So the first of these is the most common. Um, usually it's defined in terms of something like uh, looking at the dimension of parallel Jacobi fields um, along your geodesics. Uh, here the definition is equivalent, although you have to be a little bit careful if you're actually counting the dimension of the space. You have to add one um, to the dimension you get here um, to take account of the uh, actual geodesic direction, which is a parallel uh, Jacobi field. Um, let me note as well um, that for a, a slightly weaker uh, condition here, instead of the parallel vector fields here, um, we could look instead for uh, Jacobi fields along our geodesic that make this uh, constant curvature. So this is a slightly weaker condition. Okay. So this is the geometric rank that we're looking at. And the circle of results um, um, are these rank rigidity results. The setup for all of these is the following. So our manifold will be compact. And for the first result that I mentioned, we need it to be irreducible. Thank you. Okay. And the setup for each of these theorems is that higher rank of some sort implies that our manifold is locally symmetric. Okay. So there are kind of, so we have 
are two uh, categories of results here. Uh, results for the um, parallel field definition of higher rank that I spoke about, and then also uh, some results for this weaker condition where we use Jacobi fields instead. We have some results for hyperbolic rank and spherical rank. And then to get all these, get any of these results to work, we need to uh, enforce some sort of curvature bounds. Um, and these are the ones we'll look at. All right, so curvature bounded by 0, minus 1, or 1 in these different ways. Uh, the first result of this type was the rank rigidity theorem, which is um, due to um, Bauman and then separately with a different method of proof to uh, Keith Burns and Ralph Spatzer. You know, it fits in this box right here. So they showed that a non-positively curved manifold with higher um, Euclidean rank, uh, which is irreducible and compact, is a uh, locally symmetric space. Uh, Bauman's result is from 85 and actually works if uh, you just assume finite volume. And Burns and Spatzer is, I think, from 87. Um, the next positive result uh, has to do with hyperbolic rank. Uh, this is due to uh, Ursula Hammerstadt. from 91. And she showed that uh, we have the same sort of situation if you're bounded above now by curvature minus 1 and have higher hyperbolic rank than you're locally symmetric. Um, she proved this, in fact, in both of these cases. She can prove it for the weaker Jacobi field conditions, also true for parallel fields. It actually happens that if you have when your curvature is extremal here, these two things are um, equivalent. Your Jacobi fields are going to be scaled uh, parallel fields. And then the last uh, positive result to talk about uh, fits down in this box right here. If your curvature is bounded above by a positive one and you have higher spherical rank, then you're going to be a locally symmetric space. This is due to Ravi Shankar, uh, Spatz here again, and Wilking. from 05. Okay. So these are the main results. Um, unfortunately, there are not positive results in all of these situations. Uh, in a few of these uh, cases, there are counterexamples. Um, if your curvature is just bounded uh, below by 0, then there are counterexamples to this type of theorem. These are come from an idea that um, Ralph Spatz here at least attributes to Heinze. Um, I think the write-up of this is in paper by Spatz here and Straka, uh, maybe 90, late 1990 or so. Um, and the counterexample for the stronger condition gives it for the weaker one as well. And then for this uh, weaker Jacobi field condition in both of the settings around curvature one, uh, there are counterexamples. And these are in the paper by Shekhar, Spazir, and King as well. And the rest of what's up here is open. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a result that touches a little bit on this situation here. All right. So let me tell you uh, the result I'd like to show to you today. So the theorem is the following. M is a n-dimensional compact manifold, which satisfies some uh, the following conditions on curvature. We have two different cases, depending on 
the uh, dimension of the manifold, whether it's odd or even. I'll uh, show you later why uh, this sort of comes into play. When n is odd, we just need to demand that our manifold have non-positive sectional curvature and that it have Euclidean rank 1. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but this is sort of a way of uh, demanding that your non-positively curved manifold acts sort of almost all the time as if it really has uh, negative curvature. So that's for n odd, and then when n is even, we. Uh, yes, so it's not higher rank. Yeah, so this is where this problem of the two definitions comes into play. Here we're counting the dimension of parallel Jacobi fields. There's only one of them, the actual geodesic uh, direction. And then when n is even, we need the following curvature pinching condition. Our curvature has to be sort of 0.93 squared pinched. Right? I'll say where this number comes from later on. There's nothing natural about it, um, and it's not my fault. So how does this fit into the picture over here? Well, first of all, um, this gives us, uh, it fits in here, and under this, curvature pinching condition, it gives you a new proof of parts of what Hammenstein has done. It doesn't reprove everything she did. Um, oh, sorry. I need to actually state something, don't I? Got ahead of myself. All right, so then if your manifold has higher hyperbolic rank, this implies that it's a locally symmetric space. In fact, M is just constant curvature minus one. It's a hyperbolic manifold. Okay. That's what we have. So this, first of all, gives you a new proof of portions of what Hammenstadt has done. Not everything, because she can identify all the uh, negatively curved um, locally symmetric spaces. Um, but in the cases where this theorem does work, it's significantly easier than her proof. Her proof is really has a lot of very serious technology in it. It's quite difficult. It gives us new results that sort of partially deal with these situations here. Okay. And um, one other thing that I'd like to note about this is that this theorem doesn't need um, this special curvature. Uh, the value of, of C that gives you the higher rank over here. It doesn't need this special curvature, minus 1, to be extremal. So a priori, you could be dealing with a manifold where minus 1 is some sort of middle curvature value for your manifold. This is quite different than all of these results. All of these results use very essentially the fact that um, the special curvature that tells you you have higher rank is equal to the uh, actual curvature bound uh, that you're using. All right, so this is uh, quite different from those. Okay. All right. Well, the main, uh, the main tool that I'm going to use is a dynamical one. And let me tell you about that now. We're going to look at Um, for a compact manifold and irreducible, possibly. I don't know. I'm not sure.
All right, so the tool I'm going to look at here is the frame flow. So how is this defined? Well, frame flow is a flow that's very much like the geodesic flow. Uh, it acts on uh, this space here. This is the space of ordered uh, n frames to our manifold. So, yes, question? All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the result that I'd like to talk about today is a rank rigidity result. And this is one of kind of a circle of results um, which, in which we are able to characterize locally symmetric spaces by a particular uh, type of property. And this type of property is having a higher geometric rank of some sort. So let me start by saying what I mean by this higher geometric rank. So the setup is the following. Uh, suppose that suppose that along every geodesic uh, gamma sub v and a manifold. So we're looking at geodesic here with with initial uh, direction v. Um, suppose that there exists a parallel vector field P sub V such that the sectional curvature between the geodesic direction and this vector field is a constant C, and this will be the same constant uh, for all geodesics in your manifold. Um, uh, so we say that M has higher, well, first I'll talk about Euclidean rank. And this is in the case where C is equal to zero. Uh, this is what you're used to uh, hearing about for a uh, higher rank for a manifold. But we can also extend this to negative and positive curvature. So if C is negative one, we say the manifold has higher hyperbolic rank. And this is the situation that I'll be talking about today. And if C is positive one, we say that the manifold has higher spherical rank. Okay. So the first of these is the most common. Um, usually it's defined in terms of something like uh, looking at the dimension of parallel Jacobi fields um, along your geodesics. Uh, here the definition is equivalent, although you have to be a little bit careful if you're actually counting the dimension of the space. You have to add one um, to the dimension you get here um, to take account of the uh, actual geodesic direction, which is a parallel uh, Jacobi field. Um, let me note as well um, that for a, a slightly weaker uh, condition here, instead of the parallel vector fields here, um, we could look instead for uh, Jacobi fields along our geodesic that make this uh, constant curvature. That's, this is a slightly weaker condition. Okay. So this is the geometric rank that we're looking at. And the circle of results um, 
um, are these rank rigidity results. The setup for all of these is the following. So our manifold will be compact. And for the first result that I mentioned, we need it to be irreducible. Thank you. Okay. And the setup for each of these theorems is that higher rank of some sort implies that our manifold is locally symmetric. Okay. So there are kind of So we have two uh, categories of results here. Uh, results for the um, parallel field definition of higher rank that I spoke about, and then also uh, some results for this weaker condition where we use Jacobi fields instead. We have some results for hyperbolic rank and spherical rank. And then to get all these, get any of these results to work, we need to uh, enforce some sort of curvature bounds. Um, and these are the ones we'll look at. All right, so curvature bounded by 0, minus 1, or 1 in these different ways. Uh, the first result of this type was the rank rigidity theorem, which is um, due to um, Bauman and then separately with a different method of proof to uh, Keith Burns and Ralph Spatz here. You know, it fits in this box right here. So they showed that a non-positively curved manifold with higher um, Euclidean rank, uh, which is irreducible and compact, is a uh, locally symmetric space. Uh, Bauman's result is from 85 and actually works if uh, you just assume finite volume. And Burns and Spatz here is, I think, All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the result that I'd like to talk about today is a rank rigidity result. And this is one of kind of a circle of results um, which, in which we are able to characterize locally symmetric spaces by a particular uh, type of property. And this type of property is having a higher geometric rank of some sort. So let me start by saying what I mean by this higher geometric rank. So the setup is the following. Uh, suppose that suppose that along every geodesic uh, gamma sub v and a manifold. So we're looking at geodesic here with with initial uh, direction v. Um, suppose that there exists a parallel vector field P sub V such that the sectional curvature between the geodesic direction and this vector field is a constant C, and this will be the same constant uh, for all geodesics in your manifold. Um, uh, so we say that
M has higher, well, first I'll talk about Euclidean rank. And this is in the case where C is equal to zero. Uh, this is what you're used to uh, hearing about for a uh, higher rank for a manifold. But we can also extend this to negative and positive curvature. So if C is negative one, we say the manifold has higher hyperbolic rank. And this is the situation that I'll be talking about today. And if C is positive one, we say that the manifold has higher spherical rank. Okay. So the first of these is the most common. Um, usually it's defined in terms of something like uh, looking at the dimension of parallel Jacobi fields um, along your geodesics. Uh, here the definition is equivalent, although you have to be a little bit careful if you're actually counting the dimension of the space. You have to add one um, to the dimension you get here um, to take account of the uh, actual geodesic direction, which is a parallel uh, Jacobi field. Um, let me note as well um, that for a Uh, slightly weaker uh, condition here. Instead of the parallel vector fields here, um, we could look instead for uh, Jacobi fields along our geodesic that make this uh, constant curvature. Right? So this is a slightly weaker condition. So this is the geometric rank that we're looking at. And the circle of results um, um, are these rank rigidity results. The setup for all of these is the following. So our manifold will be compact. And for the first result that I mentioned, we need it to be irreducible. Thank you. Okay. And the setup for each of these theorems is that higher rank of some sort implies that our manifold is locally symmetric. Okay. So there are kind of We have two uh, categories of results here. Uh, results for the um, parallel field definition of higher rank that I spoke about, and then also uh, some results for this weaker condition where we use Jacobi fields instead. We have some results for hyperbolic rank and spherical rank. And then to get all these, get any of these results to work, we need to uh, enforce some sort of curvature bounds. Um, and these are the ones we'll look at. So curvature bounded by 0, minus 1, or 1 in these different ways. Uh, the first result of this type was the rank rigidity theorem, which is um, due to um, Bauman and then separately with a different method of proof to uh, Keith Burns and Ralph Spatz here. Now, it fits in this box right here. So they showed that a non-positively curved manifold with higher um, Euclidean rank, uh, which is irreducible and compact, is a uh, locally symmetric space. Uh, Bauman's result is from 85 and actually works if uh, you just assume finite volume. 
and Burns and Spatzer, as I think, from 87. Um, the next positive result uh, has to do with hyperbolic rank. Uh, this is due to uh, Ursula Hammenstadt. And she showed that uh, we have the same sort of situation if you're bounded above now by curvature minus one and have higher hyperbolic rank than your locally symmetric. Um, she proved this, in fact, in both of these cases. She can prove it for the weaker Jacobi field conditions, also true for parallel fields. It actually happens that if you have, when your curvature is extremal here, these two things are um, equivalent. Your Jacobi fields are going to be scaled uh, parallel fields. And then the last uh, positive result to talk about uh, fits down in this box right here. If your curvature is bounded above by a positive one and you have higher spherical rank, then you're going to be a locally symmetric space. This is due to Ravi Shankar, uh, Spatz here again, and Wilking from 05. Okay. So these are the main results. Um, Unfortunately, there are not positive results in all of these situations. Uh, in a few of these uh, cases, there are counterexamples. Um, if your curvature is just bounded uh, below by zero, then there are counterexamples to this type of theorem. These are come from an idea that um, Ralph Spatz here at least attributes to Heinze. Um, I think the write-up of this is in paper by Spatz here and Straka, uh, maybe 90, late 1990 or so. Um, and the counterexample for the stronger condition gives it for the weaker one as well. And then for this uh, weaker Jacobi field condition in both of the settings around curvature one, uh, there are counterexamples. And these are in the paper by Check our spots here in the ping as well. And the rest of what's up here is open. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a result that touches a little bit on this situation here. All right. So let me tell you uh, the result I'd like to show to you today. So the theorem is the following. M is a n-dimensional compact manifold, which satisfies some uh, the following conditions on curvature. We have two different cases, depending on the uh, dimension of the manifold, whether it's odd or even. I'll uh, show you later why uh, this sort of comes into play. When n is odd, we just need to demand that our manifold have non-positive sectional curvature and that it have Euclidean rank 1. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but this is sort of a way of uh, demanding that your non-positively curved manifold acts sort of almost all the time as if it really has uh, negative curvature. So that's for n odd, and then when n is even, we... Uh, yes, so it's not higher rank. Yeah, so this is where this problem of the two definitions comes into play. Here we're counting the dimension of parallel Jacobi fields. There's only one of them, the actual geodesic uh, direction. And then when n is even, we need the following curvature pinching condition. So our curvature has to be sort of 0.93 squared pinched. Right. I'll say where this number comes from later on. There's nothing natural about it, um, and it's not my fault. So how does this fit into the picture over here? Well, first of all, um, this gives us, uh, it fits in here, and under this, curvature pinching condition, it gives you a new proof of parts of what Hammenstadt has done. It doesn't reprove everything she did. Um, oh, sorry. 
I need to actually state something, don't I? Got ahead of myself. All right, so then if your manifold has higher hyperbolic rank, this implies that it's a locally symmetric space. In fact, M is just constant curvature minus 1. It's a hyperbolic manifold. That's what we have. So this, first of all, gives you a new proof of portions of what Hammerstadt has done. Not everything, because she can identify all the uh, negatively curved um, locally symmetric spaces. Um, but in the cases where this theorem does work, it's significantly easier than her proof. Her proof is really has a lot of very serious technology in it. It's quite difficult. It gives us new results that sort of partially deal with these situations here. Okay. And um, one other thing that I'd like to note about this is that this theorem doesn't need um, this special curvature. Uh, the value of, of C that gives you the higher rank over here. It doesn't need this special curvature minus 1 to be extremal. So a priori, you could be dealing with a manifold where minus 1 is some sort of middle curvature value for your manifold. This is quite different than all of these results. All of these results use very essentially the fact that um, the special curvature that tells you you have higher rank is equal to the uh, actual curvature bound uh, that you're using. All right, so this is uh, quite different from those. Okay. All right. Well, the main, uh, the main tool that I'm going to use is a dynamical one. And let me tell you about that now. We're going to look at Um, for a compact manifold and irreducible, possibly. I don't know. I'm not sure. All right, so the tool I'm going to look at here is the frame flow. So how is this defined? Well, frame flow is a flow that's very much like the geodesic flow. Uh, it acts on uh, this space here. This is the space of ordered uh, n frames to our manifold. So yes, question? There we go. Okay, so this, uh, what this flow does is it takes an, an ordered n frame in your manifold. It takes the first vector, and you flow that forward by the geodesic flow, and the rest of these vectors, uh, take them to be perpendicular to it, uh, follow along by parallel translation. Okay. This has uh, two types of structure that we're going to use. The first is dynamically, this is This sits above the geodesic flow, right, which you get just by forgetting all vectors but the first one. Okay. Uh, so this covers that dynamically. And the second piece of structure is that this map right here is a nice uh, principal bundle. And it has a structure group 
SO N minus 1 uh, acting on the fibers. And this is the SO N minus 1 that acts on the space perpendicular to your first vector and rotates the rest of uh, the vectors around. Um, what we'd like to know is something about the ergodic theory of this flow. Um, so the, this was studied by, by Misha Bren. Um, using this basically as a first example of a, a partially hyperbolic system. A system which is hyperbolic in all of these uh, directions seen by the geodesic flow and then isometric in the other directions, the directions that correspond to rotating in these fibers. And he's able to give a very nice description of the ergodic components. So for this type of situation, well, first of all, we see that since this sits above the geodesic flow, um, each of our ergodic components for this flow are going to cover the whole unit tangent bundle downstairs if we forget about all vectors but the first one. Right? So the only question when it comes to understanding ergodic components is what do you pick up in the fiber uh, direction for your uh, ergodic components of this flow. Okay. And what he shows is the following ergodic components. E. Are, well, they're measures that are supported on sub-bundles with structure group, um, which I'll call H, a closed group, subgroup of this sub uh, structure group SON minus 1. So H is a subgroup there. And so we have this nice uh, geometric description of what's going on with the ergodic components. Even better, we can say exactly what this group H looks like. Bryn gives a nice uh, geometric description for exactly how this thing is produced. Um, yeah, basically. Well, how can we find some elements of this uh, structure group that will describe where our ergodic component lives? Let's look at this picture here. We'll take some uh, unit vector here in our uh, space. Uh, so, sorry for all of this. This is for negative curvature. Uh, not the non-positive curvature rank one. Brin just looks at the negative curvature situation. So this vector gives us a geodesic like so. And if I take a second geodesic, uh, which is asymptotic to this guy, and look at a vector V prime, which will be asymptotic to V under the uh, forward geodesic flow, then there's going to be a unique frame based at V so that when I uh, hit both of these guys with the frame flow, they will line up as they head off to infinity. Okay. Um, what's happening here is that we're getting a stable manifold for the frame flow maybe corresponds to this original frame here, call it alpha. Right? And these stable manifolds for the frame flow sit right on top of stable manifolds for the geodesic flow. Um, and they just are things that match up when you flow them out to infinity. Okay? Now using exactly the same sort of arguments you would for the geodesic flow, um, we can say that moving along one of these stable manifolds should keep you in the same ergodic component. So these two guys should be in the same ergodic component. And likewise, by flowing in backwards time, I should be able to match this frame up with a frame along this geodesic 
a frame along this geodesic. And if you do this for an ideal polygon with an even number of sides, you're going to be able to get back to a frame here with uh, the same original starting vector v. Okay. So the uh, element of the group H that this produces should be thought of as something like what's given by frame flow around an ideal polygon. Okay. So you take this first frame here, flow it out along this polygon uh, for these four sides, and you'll get back another frame based at the same vector, but perhaps rotated by something. And the set of these rotations right here um, will generate uh, H after perhaps taking closure. So we have this very nice description of uh, what's going on with this uh, transitivity group. And that's what we're going to use in order to uh, get to the result. Yeah, so... Well, so you need an even number of sides if you want to get back to V pointing in the same direction. Otherwise, you'll be in the opposite direction. Yeah, any even number of sides you can break up into a succession of quadrilaterals. Yeah. All right, so this is the general framework for how the ergodic theory should go. Here are the results that Brennan and his co-authors are able to produce. Sorry, yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. This, uh, the transitivity group, oh, sorry, this group H that you're coming up with will be the same no matter uh, what vector you start with. Uh, so you can get from, it'll, it'll be different just by some sort of conjugation, which you can I'll sort out by, you know, maybe moving from one vector to another one oh, by one of these kind of moves. I forgot to say, this guy has a name. Uh, Brent called this the transitivity group. So here are the um, actual results on when things are ergodic. If your curvature is negative for a compact manifold and you're an odd dimensional manifold, Brin and Gromov showed that the two frame flow is ergodic. Okay, so here we're looking instead of at full n-dimensional frames, just frames of two vectors. The case for n equal, sorry, n even, was uh, investigated by Brin and Karcher. And they showed that if you have this curvature pinching, and this is where this uh, funny number is coming from, then again, the two-frame flow is ergodic. Uh, basically, the way this proof works is um, it's not too hard to show that the um, flow is going to be ergodic for just a hyperbolic manifold. And then they address the even-dimensional case uh, by looking at it as a per perturbation of this, right? And there's a series of like five or six hard estimates in here which get put together and this number comes out, but there's nothing intuitive about 0.93 and it's probably a long way from the best possible uh, estimate on this. I'll say something about that at the end. And then... No, there are no quarter counter examples for strict quarter pinching and Bryn's guess is that Strict quarter pinching should imply that it's um, ergodic. So really, this should be quarter, strict quarter pinching. So we're, it's a long way off ideal.
that's the guess. All right. And then one more thing that comes from the same paper of Brennan Gromov um, is the following. As long as your dimension is not equal to 7 or 8, the full frame flow, so this is for uh, n frames, not just two frames, is ergodic. Uh, yeah, so this is same uh, curvature conditions as above. Okay. Uh, this result basically follows from these. Um, when you're saying that the two-frame flows are conic, what you're saying is that this transitivity group acts transitively on all vectors that are perpendicular to the first vector. Okay. Um, now, if you look at the full uh, frame flow, you're going to get some sort of transitivity group describing the ergodic component. And it's got to be, if the two-frame flow is ergodic, you've got some subgroup of SON minus 1 that acts transitively on unit vectors. So there are not too many of these. Most of them, Brin and Grobov can rule out um, using various topological arguments. And you're left with just the full group SON minus 1, except spin 6 and spin 7, which they can't rule out using their topological arguments. And that's why you have this problem in dimension 7 and 8. It doesn't seem to be anything geometric or dynamical. It's just this funny kind of group theoretic topological thing that they can't quite deal with. Um, so it's, I don't know of any geometric or dynamical reason to expect 7 and 8 to actually be different than the rest of your dimensions. So these are uh, conditions that we get for ergodicity. And with these, we can right away note the following. That if the full n frame flow is ergodic, then this result that we're talking about is already proven. Higher hyperbolic rank implies that n is hyperbolic. Okay. So here's how this would work. We would look at any vector in our manifold and the uh, vector field per uh, parallel, perpendicular and parallel along this geodesic, uh, which has curvature minus 1. All right. Now we know that we can find, since we have an ergodic flow, we can find some frame, full frame, which will have a dense orbit all over the manifold. Um, but this field with curvature minus 1, which is parallel, is going to be therefore brought all over the manifold and all, give you all, uh, get you close to all possible two frames and give you curvature minus 1 everywhere. Okay? And then immediately you see you have a manifold with curvature minus 1. So the problem that's left is these two dimensions, 7 and 8. Here all we know is something about the two frame flow. And this is not quite enough to use. This uh, set of vectors which give us the uh, curvature minus 1, a priori could be a, a zero measure set. And so the two-frame flow might not, the ergodic theory of the two-frame flow isn't necessarily going to pick this up um, and tell you that it, uh, this curvature gets distributed everywhere. So we need to do something a little bit different for an argument. And the argument that addresses the kind of two-frame flow here um, will also allow us to address the uh, um, uh, the cases where um, we have non-positive curvature but Euclidean rank 1, at least in odd dimension. This uh, argument will uh, give ideas of how to deal with that as well. So let me start in just negative curvature and tell you what happens in dimensions 7 and 8. Then I'll make some remarks about how we want to adjust this to uh, deal with non-positive curvature later. Right. 
No. Yeah, there's nothing special for what I'm going to do about center. It works everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we would like to know is how the transitivity group interacts with these uh, vector fields, which give you this uh, curvature minus one with your geodesic direction. Okay. And that's the, the main piece that we want first. Well, so we know these elements of the transitivity group are built by taking parallel transformation, translations along these geodesics and then jumping across the corners of this ideal polygon using these stable manifolds. Right. Parallel translation part will not, will preserve these uh, curvature minus one fields. The question is what happens when you jump across this corner, okay? So the lemma is the following. So we're in this sort of situation here with V So we're going to in this situation here we're going to jump across this corner right here and the curve